turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Today we are continuing in our study of the Gospel of Mark after taking a brief hiatus last week. Uh, so I want to start by thanking Jim Wilson again for speaking last week so that Katie and I could celebrate four years of wedded bliss. Uh, and I also want to say thank you for your gift to us last week. It was very generous and very unexpected, and so we, uh, we were able to put it to good use, got some things to start uh, doing some preschool things with Macy at home. So that was, we, we appreciate that. Uh, when we were last in the Gospel of Mark, we uh, had left Jesus in a boat. Jesus was in a boat on the lake on the Sea of Galilee. He's pushed off from shore a little bit, and he has been teaching in parables to the people who are on the shore. And it's sort of a, a sermon lecture uh, in the first half of chapter 4. And so as we pick up today, Jesus is still in the boat, but he's done with his sermon. And so now uh, we're going to move on with, uh, with what Mark has to tell us about this man. So we'll begin in verse 35. Mark says, That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So Jesus is in this fishing boat, and he decides he's going to cross to the other side of the lake. Why does he need to go over there? I don't know. Maybe the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, But just to give you an idea of where this is happening, this is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, This is taken from modern-day Tiberias, down there at the bottom. Looking, So that's on the west side, so we're looking east. Uh, And the the lake, you can see, is about 8 miles across. You can see it from your hotel room. It's 12 miles from north to south. Uh, Jesus is probably up closer to Capernaum, so he's a few miles north along the shore to the left. Uh, But this is the area that he's sailing to on the other side. Now, the Sea of Galilee sits approximately 630 feet below sea level. It is the only freshwater lake in the world below sea level. It is the second lowest lake in the world, period, the other one being the Dead Sea, 70 miles to the south. So often what happens, because this is such a low lake, is you'll have a weather system that moves off the Mediterranean, comes in heading east, and it gets sort of churned up in the hills, and it'll pass right over the sea, and it'll hit those hills on the other side, and that'll cause it to drop down, and you get this kind of riptide effect. And so often you have storms happen on the Sea of Galilee that very quickly become very violent, and that's what happens on this particular day. Jesus is out on a boat, probably where that little white speck is, somewhere in there, and the waves begin to crash over into the boat. And somehow Jesus is able to stay asleep in the back of the boat. I imagine it's because he's been preaching all day, and so I can kind of relate to that. He's just absolutely exhausted. And the disciples come up and grab him by the lapels, and they shake him, because he has lapels, and they shake him. And they say, Jesus, you're a miracle worker. Do something about this. No, they, they actually, they don't say that. They say, why does this always happen to me and always at the least convenient time? Why doesn't it ever happen to somebody else? No, they don't say that. Actually, what they say is, don't you care that we're drowning? Don't you care? I think that's a question I can relate to. Don't you care? Don't you even see what I'm going through? Don't you see my pain? Don't you see my struggles? Don't you even, are you still sleeping? They're not asking him to to work miraculous powers. They don't know that he can get up and say, rain, rain, go away, and it actually will. They don't know that. All they are griping about is, don't you care? Something that I can relate to. 
But Jesus, who is not disturbed by the storm, is roused by the pleading of his disciples. And so he stands up and he essentially says, rain, rain, go away, quiet, be still. He rebukes it the same way that he rebukes a demon. And it actually works. The storm dies down. The waves stop crashing. The wind stops blowing. And the disciples, who had just been asking, don't you care, start asking a different question. They start saying, who is this? Who is this man that speaks to water and the water listens to him? Who is this that not only casts out demons and heals the sick and defends the guilty, but sort of has nature under his thumb? Now, this is not totally unprecedented for someone to control the weather like this. Uh, In the book of Exodus, we read about Moses calling down a plague of hail on the Egyptians. Uh, Noah beats the flood in Genesis. Elijah in 1 Kings uh, causes it to stop raining for three years by prayer. And so it's not totally unprecedented that someone would be able to control the weather. But when someone you know, when someone that you are sitting next to tells a storm to be quiet and the storm listens... You step back and you kind of reevaluate your friend and you start asking yourself, who is this? I thought we were just dealing with a a teacher slash healer slash exorcist, but this, this puts him into a completely different category. Now we, as the readers of Mark's gospel, we already know the answer to this question. Because we've been reading since chapter 1, and we know what happens in chapter 1. The very first verse in Mark says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then uh, a few verses later, down in chapter 1, verse 11, Jesus is baptized, and as he comes up out of the water, he sees heaven being torn open, and Jesus sees the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, and he hears this voice say, You are my Son. Now, the disciples weren't there for that. They didn't see that. They didn't hear that. They don't know that God has claimed Jesus as his son. To them, he is a healer, teacher, exorcist, which is why they say, who is this? But we as the reader, we know the answer to the question. We know this, that he is son of God. But we don't know necessarily what it means to be son of God. If you were here uh, for that lesson, goodness, that was like five or six weeks ago, if you were here for that, uh, you remember that we said when Mark uses the term son of God, for him it is not uh, this this divine uh, second person of the Trinity, uh, God in the flesh kind of language. That's called a Christological reading or a Christological reading. That's not how Mark is using it. He's using it in a Jewish way. Jesus is not the first person in the Bible that is called son of God. Uh, We we talked about how kings in the line of David are called son of God, how the nation of Israel is called son of God, angels are called sons of God. And so the term son of God refers to an individual who has a unique role in human history. So when Mark says that Jesus is son of God, that means that he has a unique role in human history. We know this. The disciples don't. We do. We do. But that doesn't mean we know what his role is. And so we still are asking the question, who is this? But we don't ask it to the same degree of blindness that the disciples are asking it. Now Mark is going to give us four answers to this question in our text this morning. He's going to tell us four stories, four deliverances, four miracles that tell us who is this. And the first is the story that we've already read, the calming of the storm. And so when we read the story, we have to ask, who is this Jesus? And the answer we get is that Jesus has power over disaster. This is the story that gives birth to the English expression, the storms of life. When we talk about the storms of life, what we're getting that from is this. And that's good and that's helpful, but At the same time, I fear that the more allegorical we make this, the more power it's going to lose. 
I think it's helpful for us to remember that Jesus calmed an actual storm with actual rain and waves in an actual place that you can go and take a picture of and take a boat out onto the lake where it happened if you wanted to. Jesus has power over disaster, very real disaster. This episode presents us with a Jesus who is dominant over creation, who is calm in the face of disaster. He is fearless. Do not mistake his absence for his unconcern. There may be times in your life that it feels like God is a million miles away, that he's asleep, that he doesn't care, and we bang on his chest in our prayers and say, don't you care? We want to grab God by the lapels. Doesn't he see my trouble? Doesn't he see my affliction, my suffering, my disaster? Oh, yes, yes, he sees it. He is simply unafraid of it. Because Jesus has power over disaster. And if he has power over disaster, then we don't need to be afraid either. So they cross this lake. They start on the west side, uh, the northwest side, and they cross over to the other, to the east side. To the Gentile side of the lake, and there they encounter an unfriendly figure in chapter 5. Mark says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So this guy is possessed by a demon, if that was unclear. This is not the first time that we have encountered a demoniac in the Gospel of Mark, but this is certainly uh, the biggest one. Uh, this is the pinnacle of Jesus' career as an exorcist. And so I think that makes this a good time to stop and talk about demons. So for just a moment, I, I want to pause and sort of step aside from the story, and let's just talk about the idea of demons. Um, we live in a Scooby-Doo world. If you've ever seen the show Scooby-Doo, uh, you know, every episode, there would be some monster or demon or uh, ghost that is haunting a house or terrorizing a town or something like that. And so these was it, four teenagers, five teenagers would uh, pile into their mystery van and they would follow the clues. And at the end of every episode, they would find out that the monster or ghost or demon is really Mr. Hendrickson from the Five and Dime store and he's just wearing a mask, and I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't have been for you meddling kids. Uh, Scooby-Doo is reflective of the modern worldview, where there is as much room for demons as there is for dragons or unicorns, which is none at all. It's reflective of the belief that behind every demon, behind every monster, there is a perfectly rational explanation. And so demons really are just something that needs to be unmasked, which presents a problem for us if we want to say that the Bible is true, because this guy is clearly purported to have a demon, and as we'll see, not just one, but hundreds and thousands of demons. So what do you do with this story and with stories like it? What do you do with stories where demons are being presented? Do you say that the story just didn't happen, that it is a fable, that it is a myth, that it is a story created by the church to make Jesus look powerful? Do you say that, well, what the guy really had was dissociative identity disorder, and uh, they didn't have that kind of terminology, and so they just used the word demon? That's how they understood it, and so to be fair to them, that's how they thought of it. But we, being much more enlightened, because we are the smartest generation that has ever lived. We know what, was, what it really was. Or perhaps it was epilepsy in, in another case or any number of things. Do we say that demon possession happened back then, but it doesn't really happen now, the same way that it really doesn't seem to happen in the Old Testament? What do you do with a story 
about demons? Uh, it's a good question. That's why I asked it. Uh, I think, not to toot my own horn, um, I think one answer that is helpful is in the modern world, we tend to think that there is one explanation for something like this guy. Either he has dissociative identity disorder or he has a so-called demon. And obviously, we know that people actually have this. We can't confirm demons, and so it must be this and not that because there's, it's got to be one or the other. Um, but I see no reason why it can't be both, why there can't be a spiritual cause and a material cause. Uh, we live in this sort of one cause kind of world. But the world of the scriptures is not a one cause kind of world. It is a world of, uh, of spirit and soil, of disease and demons. It's a world where demons live and walk among us and you can catch a demon the same way that you can catch an infection. Um, and, and so I think that that is helpful just to realize that, uh, that you don't have to choose between the two. It can be both. Uh, and personally, I'll, I'll just say this. I am not comfortable yet with weighing in whether I think demon possession happens as frequently today as it did back then. I haven't decided yet what I think on that. So just to be fair, that's sort of where I fail to stand anywhere. Um, okay, but we meet this guy. And he's been living in a cemetery. He's breaking chains. He's howling into the night sky. I imagine he's probably naked. And nobody has been able to bind the strong man. But then there's Jesus. Jesus arrives at the shore where the man has been living. And we pick up in verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Which is interesting that he knows that and the disciples don't. Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. So the man runs into Jesus. He runs up to Jesus, and he identifies him right away. And the first thing he does is he falls on his knees in front of Jesus. And Jesus commands the demons to, to come out, uh, plural, because there are many, many of them. And they get permission from Jesus to enter this herd of pigs, and the pigs die. So let's go back to our picture of the sea again. Um, Jesus finds out that this man calls himself Legion. Uh, Legion was a military division in the Roman uh, military, just like we have units and troops and battalions and branches, and I can't keep straight how they're all organized. Uh, they had legions. And a legion was a group of approximately 5,400 soldiers, which raises the question of how many demons this guy really has, probably in the thousands. And when this man, who is in a spiritual crisis, runs up to Jesus, the two of them duke it out in a battle of epic proportions. Correct? No. No, he runs up to Jesus and he immediately falls on his knees in submission. And they are asking Jesus for permission to exercise themselves, which I think is just great. They have to ask for permission from Jesus to cast themselves out. And Jesus gives them permission. They get into, the, into these pigs and they run down the hill into the lake. Now, this picture uh, is taken, uh, the, the land that you see on the other side of the lake is a region called uh, Garasa. 
the story that we read is supposed to take place in Gerasa, or you probably have a footnote that says Gadara or Gergesa. Uh, different copies of Mark say different things. We have lots and lots and lots of copies of Mark from, uh, from the ancient world, and they all read this uh, one of three ways. The most reliable copies say Gadara, uh, but Gadara is 25 miles to the south east uh, on the other side of the lake. I can never keep east and west straight. You guys are starting to realize this, though. Um, it's 25 miles away. And so if it's Gadara, then you have these pigs who run down into the hill and they die. And the pig herders run a marathon back to town. And they say, all our pigs are gone. And then the whole town runs a marathon back out, which seems kind of unlikely. Not that we're dealing with things that are really likely, but still, it seems like you'd think Mark would say something. Uh, and so it, it probably is not Gadara. And then you have uh, the land of Gergesa, or excuse me, uh, Gerasa, which I know you guys are taking copious notes, so it really matters. Gerasa is about five miles away from here to the south, and it does sit much closer to the lake. You could conceivably run the four or five miles and then run four or five miles back. That's possible. Uh, the problem is, if you were to take this picture and sort of pan over to the right, the hills drop off and there's nothing for pigs to run down. There is no hill. There is no steep bank. It's, it's a plain. But then you have this. Some copies say, whichever one this is, can't, I can't keep them straight, uh, Gergesa. This is Gergesa. Uh, this is a region where obviously there are hills that the pigs could run down and it's right there for Jesus to exercise the guy. You can see they might run into town and it's not that far of a jaunt. So it's probably, I think, Gergesa. But I know that was very interesting for all of you, geography lesson. Uh, you can take that one home. That's for free. Uh, okay, verse 14. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. When the, then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So the people that own these pigs watch their investment portfolio literally take a plunge. I've been sitting on that for like three weeks. They go and they get a mob and they come back for blood, but then they find the demoniac who has spent who knows how many years in captivity to spiritual dehumanizing powers, sitting down calmly, no longer naked. He's normal. This man who has been in spiritual crisis probably for years has been released. Jesus released him. Jesus healed him. And then the question that the disciples have been asking echoes. Who is this? That this man who no one could bind would come up and beg for permission. This is a man with power over the unseen. Jesus has power over demons. Power over spiritual crisis. Jesus is a man, but he's a man with power that transcends ours. And he is not only more aware of the spiritual dimension of our world, but he is able to manipulate it much more effectively than you or I can. Now, when I read this story and I read about Legion, I think about how revulsive this man is to me. I think about how easily I become uncomfortable around someone who has been ravaged by dehumanizing forces. I think about how I treat people as if they were this demoniac. People who are severely injured, deformed, 
people with uh, genetic disorders or psychological illness. I, I told you I'm not real comfortable yet with saying whether I think demon possession happens just as frequently today, but I can say confidently that dehumanization happens just as frequently today as it did back then. And I can say that it, it creates spiritual crisis in those who are afflicted. And yet, Jesus has power over all of that. He has power over the demonic, over the unseen, over the ravaged. There is a spiritual plane to this world that affects everything from hearts to harvests to homelessness. And Jesus has power over it all. So Jesus exercises these demons and he sends the guy home to go tell about it. And then Jesus gets back in the boat and he heads back across the lake. If you notice, there's a lot of going back and forth across the lake a lot uh, in this book. So we'll pick up in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, those poor disciples who've been rowing for like days, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. I lost my place. Where was I? They came, pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So Jesus preaches these parables in chapter 4 over here. And then he crosses the sea, calms the storm. Who is this? He's one who calms storms, and then he heals the guy with all of the demons, and then he crosses back probably back to where he told the parables, and there's this crowd waiting for him. And someone in the crowd says, hey, my daughter is sick. Come take care of my daughter. And so Jesus is on his way to this guy's house. And I kind of, when I picture it in my head, it's like Jesus is in the middle of this crowd, the same way, it's like a colony of penguins, like waddling together how they do. That's kind of how it is in my head. Um, not that that matters at all. Uh, but there's this woman in this colony of penguins who has been sick for 12 years. But she's not just a, a normal person who happens to have a disease. She is the disease. I mean, all we know about her is that she's been bleeding for 12 years. She's been branded for life. She is ostracized. She's been excommunicated, rejected. Her identity is wrapped up in her malady. And for 12 years, she has been a slave of her disease. And verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So Jesus is on his way to some guy's house. Meanwhile, there is a woman in their midst who is there illegally. She, by law, is not allowed to be interacting with other people. She is supposed to be isolated. She has a female problem. She has a flow of blood. It's been this way for 12 years. And she comes up behind Jesus, and she reaches for the hem of his clothing. And in that moment, she experiences divine glory in the form of, of a divine healing. She senses in her body that she has been healed. She encounters the glory of God from Jesus' backside. And Jesus turns around. He wants to find this woman. 
He knows the power has flowed out of him, and so he starts looking, and his disciples are saying, well, everybody is touching you. Everybody is crowding around you. But Jesus recognizes the difference between elbows and fingertips. And the woman, knowing that she has been healed, comes up to Jesus, and she falls on her knees before him. And she tells her whole testimony. She's trembling with fear, fear that she'll be rejected, fear maybe that he'll undo the healing or that he'll treat her according to the law. But Jesus sends her home in peace. He says her faith has healed her. Faith in what? Well, faith in Jesus. Well, that again raises the question, well, then who is Jesus? And the question echoes. Mark shows us a Jesus who has power over disease. In the Greek New Testament, there is this word asthenes, uh, or astheneo is the verb, which means to be sick or uh, disease, illness. It occurs in its various forms approximately 85 times in the New Testament. And what we like to do in the 21st century uh, in the Scooby-Doo world is we like to say, well, these times, in these verses, it means physically sick. And over here in these verses, it means spiritually sick. And so we'll take a verse like James 5 that says, If any one of you is sick, he should call the elders to come and anoint him with oil, and the prayer of a righteous man will make the sick man well. And we say, well, that means spiritually sick. The problem is, there's only one word. Is there any reason that it can't be both? Again, when you're sick, you are the disease. Ask anyone who has ever been branded as a little person. Ask anyone who is an amputee or who has a, a, an obvious deformity, whether they have been branded their whole lives by their condition. I believe that they would agree with me. Jesus isn't healing this woman just of a spiritual condition as though she were only spiritually sick. Her physical sickness and her spiritual sickness go hand in hand. And he does heal her of a very real physical malady, the same kind that we pray about, the same kind that are on our prayer list. The same kind of sickness that's, that is so evident all around the world. It should never be that we are concerned about a person's body, but what we're really concerned about is their soul. I've heard that said so many times. You know, we're, we're, really, we're concerned about their health, but what we're really concerned about is their spiritual health, when really the two go hand in hand. So Jesus heals this woman, a sick woman, because he has power, not just in a spiritual sense, over demons and cosmology and the supernatural. He has power over things like germs and tumors and viruses and brain damage and car accidents and hospital rooms and operating rooms and headaches and hemorrhages. Now, remember that Jesus was on his way to heal somebody before he got interrupted his story sort of uh, picks up afterward. Uh, so you have, he starts going to this guy's house, and then there's this woman, and then he finishes going to the guy's house. So it's kind of sandwiched together. That's the, that's the technical theological term, is a sandwich. You think I'm kidding. It's called a Markin sandwich. That's the theological term, which sounds delicious, doesn't it? Um, it happens over and over, but this one's interesting. Okay, so... Uh, Jesus is on his way to this guy's house. We'll pick up at the beginning of his story again, and then we'll skip back down uh, in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. This guy is a leader in the local synagogue. And he comes and he kneels before Jesus and he begs that Jesus would come and heal his daughter. Uh, infant mortality, very high in the ancient world. Uh, if you've had kids, you know when kids are cutting teeth, they tend to get infections, ear infections. It happened to Macy multiple times. And in a world without antibiotics, an ear infection can become very deadly very fast. So infant mortality is something like 50% of the, 
of children were dead before the age of 10. If you could make it to 10, then you had a pretty good shot of making it to about 50. And then the death rate kind of picks up again. So people who are 70 are like really cherished in the ancient world as this locus of wisdom and tradition. Uh, so it's understandable why Jairus is upset. Very high threat of, uh, of death. And so Jesus goes with Jairus, and along the way, he gets interrupted by the bleeding woman. And then down in verse 35, it says, While Jesus was still speaking to the woman, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? In the time that it took Jesus to heal the woman, the little girl passed away. One life for another. And Jairus' servants arrive to tell him that it's no use. It's over. Don't bother him anymore. This one can't be salvaged. This situation can't be saved. Verse 36, ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Now stop right there. Believe what? My daughter is dead. And you're telling me not to be afraid, not to be upset, not to be a little flustered? Give me a break. What can you do? I mean, even Jesus has his limits, right? He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Well, now here's the thing. She is dead. She's not in some kind of trance with an undetectably slow pulse. She's dead. She's rotting. This has already been established. Decay is already, I don't know know how quickly decay sets in, but she is gone. So how can Jesus say that she's asleep? It's because Jesus thinks about death and decay differently than we do. We think of death as the final word in a cosmic battle between good and evil. Jesus thinks of death as a nap. It's a nap that ends in rejuvenation and victory. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him And went in where the child was, not the corpse, not the shell, the child. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Who is this Jesus? This is a man who has power over death. Death itself kneels in surrender. Death itself buckles under the weight of his authority. Death itself cowers at the sound of his breath. And the remark, why bother him anymore, has no place in a relationship with Jesus. It ain't over. Yeah, the little girl died, but it ain't over. And that means we can still bother him, if in fact it is a bother, which I don't believe that it is. There is room for lament within faith. There is room for a follower of Jesus to stand up and say, God, fix it. Why her? Why him? Why now and not later? God is bigger than our aching hearts. Jesus is bigger than our aching hearts. What have you been afraid of? Disaster? Demons? Some kind of spiritual crisis? Disease? Death? What aches your heart? What instills fear where there could be faith? Mark offers us a solution to the problem of our fear. It is a Jesus who has power, authority, clout, strength, powerful enough to step into crisis and powerful enough to handle our lament when he doesn't. 
I'd like to end a little bit differently this morning than, than most mornings. I'd like to end with the reading of Psalm 24. And if you would, I'd like to invite you to please stand. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Would you pray with me? Lord, all of the power is yours. You have power over things that we cannot even touch, things that change our plans on the weekends and things that change our plans for the next 10 and 20 years things that we have no ability to discern, you direct. And things we have no ability to quell, you crush. Lord, all of the power is yours. And Father, you have empowered your servant Jesus with, with the same authority. And so, Father, we humbly stand in your presence and we recognize that you are are the king, that you are mighty in battle. Father, we pray for your blessing, for your protection, and for your guidance. We pray for those that are on our prayer list, for those who are struggling and hurting. We pray that you would provide healing. And Father, we anticipate a day that you will raise us from the grave. Lord, we love you, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Love you guys.